Okay, so we're beginning the lecture that is about shock. And the first part of the lecture, we will just be covering the first objective, which is talking about the different types of shock and the clinical pathology of those common types of shock. And then we're going to differentiate between those shocks, and then we'll dive into more on upcoming lectures. <clears throat> so remember the shock is a disease. I mean, it's not a disease. It is a condition. So basically what happens with shock, the cells have the inability to exchange gas. So if they don't have the ability to exchange gas, then they do not have the ability to function. Oxygenation and tissue perfusion are not being met. This is a whole body response. It is a life-threatening emergency and all body organs are affected. So if we review the gas exchange and perfusion, there's three things that really are affected by the map. And you know you have to have an adequate map before your perfusion to actually take place. So the three things that affect your map are the cardiac output, which is your stroke volume and heart rate, the size and the integrity of your vascular bed. So those are your three things that you're going to be looking at. With perfusion, the body can selectively increase or decrease blood flow to specific areas. Uh, so like if you don't need, if you're really trying to get blood flow to important things like the heart, the liver, and the pancreas, then they can decrease blood flow to other areas such as maybe the feet or the hands or your GI tract. And that's kind of how we're going to look at different things as we go through shock. So the first type of shock that we're going to talk about is hypovolemic shock. And it's just what it sounds by using, you know, our basic vocabulary understanding of hypovolemic. That just simply means there's a loss of blood volume. This blood volume is actually lost from the body itself. So it's basically too little blood volume that's circulating. Some of our obvious reasons would be like a patient's super dehydrated or a patient's bleeding. So I have listed here some of the causes of hypovolemic shock, and you guys should be aware of most of these and understand how they would actually uh, decrease circulating volume. <clears throat> so as our blood volume goes down, we're already aware that that decreases our blood pressure. Decrease in blood pressure will also decrease in our MAP. Um, how do you think a decreased blood pressure is going to impa impact your oxygenation? Well, initially, your body can compensate uh, based off some baroreceptors. If your volume gets too low and those baroreceptors in the carotid arteries and stuff aren't stretched the way that they should, the first thing they're going to do is try to compensate and make sure that the vital organs, vital organs are getting oxygen first. So as I already mentioned, the heart, the brain, and those kind of things, they have to be oxygenated first. So if you're able to compensate at this particular point in time and you stop the bleeding or stop the reason for the loss of volume, then the body can keep up and you're only in a temporary stage of shock. It's reversible. It's corrective if it happens like within an hour or two. Uh, of course, if you just the opposite takes place, if you let it continue and continue, then this can end up having where multiple organs actually f end up failing. So we got to make sure that we're finding those things and we're stopping them adequately. <clears throat> so think of cardiogenic shock. That's actually where the heart is sick. So you have an unhealthy heart that's unable to pump out blood around. So this is different than hypovolemic shock because uh, think about somebody that's in heart failure and their ejection fraction is really, really low. And so as they pump, the heart doesn't squeeze very good. And if the heart doesn't squeeze very good, then it's not putting out very much oxygen, uh, rich blood to the organs and the tissue that needs it. And so in that case, that would indi indicate that the patient's not getting perfused. So if we think about what might cause a sick heart, hopefully you guys are automatically thinking um, of an MI. So I want you to pause just a second and I want you to think about which of the four answers is related to cardiogenic shock. And as I already mentioned, the number one cause of cardiogenic shock is actually an MI, any condition that causes the heart's ability to pump adequately.
cardiomyopathy, cardiac arrest would also be op, um, different types of things that would be cardiogenic shock. With cardiogenic shock, what I really want you to think about is what would a patient with um, stage four, class four congestive heart failure look like? So when you're assessing these patients, that's what you're going to basically see is a patient with severe heart failure. So the things that you have to watch for, of course, would be on page in your book that talks about this is uh, severe tachycardia because your patient is trying to compensate. They got hypotension. They got a systolic blood pressure of less than 90 or either the drop, the blood pressure is dropped uh, 30 millimeters of mercury less than what their baseline was. Also, something that would indicate the kidneys aren't getting perfused. In those cases, the, bo the body's compensating and trying to get the vital tissues perfused, and that means they're going to get cold and clammy. You're not going to be able to feel pulses, or they're going to be really, really light or weak. Um, the brain's not getting good perfusion, so the patients get agitated, restless, confused. You also know with heart failure, you're going to see the fluid backs up in the lungs, so you get the pulmonary congestion, and then they may continue to have um, chest discomfort with this as well. If we don't detect this early, it has a very high mortality rate. The next type of shock that we're going to talk about is distributive shock. Distributive shock is a type of shock where the blood volume is not lost from the body. So it's not like when you're bleeding or vomiting or, or peeing out excess volume. But this blood, the volume of the blood is not lost from the body, but it's sitting in the interstitial tissues. And if it's sitting in the interstitial tissues, then we know that it can't perfuse vital organs. During this, it's, it happens like when you have the blood vessels dilate and when they dilate you have this pooling of blood in the venous and capillary beds uh, the capillaries leak worse things that could could cause this would be something like sepsis where you have your the whole body has inflammation it could be anaphylaxis where you have a reaction to um, a bee sting or latex or something where you just have massive swelling uh, also with burns, we're going to talk about burns coming up and, and burn patients also will experience some capillary leak where their body just leaks fluid into the tissues and that type of thing. So then let's think about this. Which of the four answers is related to distributive shock? Just some little quizzes for you guys to stop and do. Pause your video, figure out which one it is. So remember with an anaphylactic reaction, you have an extreme type 1 allergic reaction, and within seconds you have loss of blood vessel tone systemically. That loss of blood vessel tone means everything just dilates. When everything dilates massively, fluid starts leaking out in the interstitial tissue, your blood pressure is going to bottom out, your cardiac output is going to go down, um, you're going to end up with respiratory distress and actually circulatory failure. And you guys should be somewhat familiar with this when you covered um, your immunity in third semester. And these are just some things that uh, are common causes of anaphylactic shock. So always just be aware of, of, of people that have these type of allergies and have anaphylaxis in the past or a history of anaphylaxis, just be super cautious for any of those patients. And be cautious when you're given antibiotics or something because if patients are on antibiotics, they're going to automatically be at risk for some type of reaction and it could be anaphylactic. So what are some...
So what is going to be your manifestations of that? A manifestation of anaphylactic shock would be all of a sudden you have anxiety, confusion, and dizziness. You have this, oh my God, something's happening. They may have chest pains. They may wet themselves. Often you'll see that this massive swelling of the tongue, angioedema, and then you're going to immediately hear that, that wheeze, that strider, break out in hives everywhere. So what are you going to do for these patients? You got to give the epi. So like epi pins, hopefully patients that have um, had an anaphylactic reaction have their epi pin with them. You're going to give some Benadryl, some diphenhydramine, which is the Benadryl. Um, often these patients are intubated immediately protecting that airway. You're going to tr also try to make sure you're doing bronchodilators to keep the airway open. Even give them some aer um epinephrine. And these, like I said, these patients are often intubated. <clears throat> you're going to give massive fluid boluses with these patients. And also you're going to give IV corticosteroids if hypotension persists after two hours of aggressive therapy. Sepsis is another type of distributive shock where you have a wide uh, spread infection throughout the entire body. Your whole body gets inflamed. All the fluid starts leaking out into the capillary and in the interstitial tissues, and you uh, end up losing fluid, fluid volume. This is just an example of capillary leak syndrome. The one with the legs is actually a burn patient, and you can just see the, the massive inflammation. The guy on the uh, right with the belly is just an example of somebody that has uh, ascites from liver disease. But you can see the flu is not lost from the body. It's just lost from circulation. Obstructive heart is a lot different than cardiogenic um, heart or cardiogenic shock. The heart's healthy. So this guy's nice and healthy, but something's causing him not to be able to uh, properly uh, have cardiac output. This can be from something like a tension pneumothorax. It could be from a PE. It could be from, you know, like high blood pressure in the lungs, like pulmonary hypertension. Uh, the main cause of this, though, is actually going to be, um, well, answer this one, and then I'll tell you what the main cause is. What type of shock is obstructive shock? Stop, answer your question. So the number one cause of obstructive shock is actually cardiac tamponade, where there's so much fluid around the heart. The heart's fine, but the fluid is just pushing on it so so strong and so hard that they actually cannot, the heart can't feel and so it can't squeeze out. And remember with cardiac tamponade, you're going to have distending neck veins, accumulation of fluid around there, so it's going to sound muffled. And you're also going to have um, hypotension. So I just have on here a brief little outline of what it may look like with obstructive shock. And don't know if you like charts, but this is just a way to look at it in a chart form.